In this video, we'll look at orthogonal sets. We'll define what an orthogonal set is and look at some theorems associated with them. We say that a set of vectors u1 through up in Rn is an orthogonal set if each distinct pair of vectors in the set is orthogonal. That means ui dot uj is equal to zero whenever i is not equal to j. Let's take a look at a quick example of an orthogonal set. So here we want to show that u1, the vector 1, 2, 3, u2, negative 8, negative 2, 4, and u3, negative 1, 2, negative 1, form an orthogonal set. To confirm this, what I want to do is take the dot product between any two pair of these vectors and check that it's equal to zero. So if I have u1 dot u2, I have 1 times negative 8 plus 2 times negative 2 plus 3 times 4, so that's negative 8 minus 4 plus 12, and that's equal to 0. That's good. Next, I'll do u1 dot u3. So that's going to be 1 times negative 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 3 times negative 1, which gives me negative 1 plus 4 minus 3. And again, that's equal to 0. Lastly, I need to check u2 dot u3. So that's going to be negative 8 times negative 1 plus negative 2 times 2 plus 4 times negative 1. So that's positive 8 minus 4 minus 4, which again gives me 0. So we see that each distinct pair of these vectors is orthogonal. So that confirms that the set u1, u2, u3 is an orthogonal set. So now let's look at a theorem. Suppose that I have an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors u1 through up. Let's call this set S. Then S is a basis for the span of the vectors u1 through up. So let's prove this theorem. To show that a set is a basis for a subspace, we need two things. We need that the set is linearly independent, and we need that the span of the set is equal to the subspace. In this case, the second condition is automatically satisfied because our subspace is the span of the vectors in S. So all we need to do is check that the vectors in S are linearly independent. Let's start by considering the following equation. C1 times U1 plus C2 times U2 summed up through Cp times Up equals the zero vector. Now, if we can show that this equation only has the trivial solution, c1 equals 0, c2 equals 0, and so forth, cp equals 0, then we can conclude that the vectors u1 through up are linearly independent. So what I'm going to do is take this equation and take the dot product of both sides with the vector ui for some i between 1 and p. So I have ui dot c1 u1, c2 u2, summed up through CPUP equals UI dot the zero vector. Now on the left, I'll have C1 UI dot U1 plus C2 UI dot U2 and so forth plus CP UI dot UP. On the right, UI dot zero is just zero. Since the vectors in the set u are orthogonal, I know that ui dot uj is equal to 0 whenever i is not equal to j. So a lot of terms on the left-hand side are going to equal 0. The only term that remains is ci times ui dot ui. Now ui dot ui is not 0 because ui is not the 0 vector, so this forces ci to equal 0. So if I take my original equation, C1U1 summed up through CPUP equals the zero vector, and I take the dot product with UI for every I from 1 to P, then I'll be able to conclude that CI is equal to zero for every I from 1 to P. And that tells me that the vectors U1 through UP are linearly independent. And therefore, S is a basis for the span of U1 through UP. So what we'll see is that it's nice to have a basis consisting of orthogonal vectors. So let's talk a little bit about orthogonal bases. 
a set of vectors is an orthogonal basis for a subspace H if it's a basis for H that is also an orthogonal set. So you might be wondering, why do we want an orthogonal basis for a vector space? The answer is that it's easy to write vectors as a linear combination of vectors in an orthogonal basis. This is illustrated in this next theorem. Let u1 through up be an orthogonal basis for a subspace H of Rn. Then for any vector v in H, we can write v as a linear combination of the vectors u1 through up. Now in general, you can do this whenever you have a basis, but when you have an orthogonal basis, then the weights ci is equal to v dot ui divided by ui dot ui. So here's a quick sketch of the proof. Again, since I have a basis for h by the unique representation theorem, I can write any vector v as a linear combination of the vectors in your basis. Now if I take this equation and dot it with ui, I get v dot ui equals c1 u1 dot ui plus c2 u2 dot ui and so forth summed up through cp up dot ui. Since the vectors u1 through up are orthogonal, a lot of the terms on the right hand side will cancel out, leaving me with v dot ui is equal to ci ui dot ui. Dividing both sides by ui dot ui, I end up with ci equals v dot ui over ui dot ui. So what this theorem allows us to do is write v as a linear combination of the vectors u1 through up very easily. Remember that if the basis was not orthogonal, then to find the weights c1 through cp, you would need to make an augmented matrix and row reduce. But in the case where you do have orthogonal vectors, all you have to do to find the weights is take dot products. So let's look at an example. So consider the set of vectors u1 equals 1, 2, 3, u2 equals negative 8, negative 2, 4, u3 equals negative 1, 2, negative 1. Remember that in our first example of the video, we found that this set of three vectors is an orthogonal set. Now since they're orthogonal, I also know that they are a linearly independent set of vectors. And if I have three linearly independent vectors in R3, their span is going to be all of R3. So here U1, U2, U3 is an orthogonal basis for R3. So what we want to do is write the vector V equals 3, 1, 4 as a linear combination of U1, U2, U3. Again, if we didn't know that U1, U2, and U3 were an orthogonal basis for R3, then to answer this question, we would need to form the augmented matrix 1, 2, 3, negative 8, negative 2, 4, negative 1, 2, negative 1, augmented with 3, 1, 4, then row reduce this to get the weights for the linear combination. But since u1, u2, and u3 is an orthogonal basis, then we can find the weights c1 by doing v dot u1 divided by u1 dot u1. So v dot u would be 3 times 1, plus 1 times 2, plus 4 times 3, and u1 dot u1 would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. So that gives me 3 plus 2 plus 12 divided by 1 plus 4 plus 9, which is 17 over 14. Similarly, we can calculate c2 equals v dot u2 divided by u2 dot u2. That's going to be 3 times negative 8 plus 1 times negative 2 plus 4 times 4 divided by u2 dot u2 so that's negative 8 squared plus negative 2 squared plus 4 squared. This gives us negative 24 minus 2 plus 16 divided by 64 plus 4 plus 16 and this equals negative 10 over 84. To find C3, we do C3 equals V dot U3 divided by U3 dot U3. So that's going to be 3 times negative 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 4 times negative 1 divided by negative 1 squared plus 2 squared plus negative 1 squared. 
This equals negative 3 plus 2 minus 4 divided by 1 plus 4 plus 1, which is negative 5 sixth. So V as a linear combination of U1, U2, and U3 would be V equals 17 over 14 U1 minus 10 over 84 U2 minus 5 sixth U3. So again, the process of finding the linear combination is much easier once you know that you have an orthogonal basis. But things can get even more simple if you have something called an orthonormal basis. We say that a set of vectors u1 through up is an orthonormal set if it's an orthogonal set and if each vector has norm 1. Furthermore, if an orthonormal set is a basis for some subspace, then we call it an orthonormal basis. So if we return to our previous theorem, we have that if u1 through up is an orthonormal basis for h, then any vector v in h can be written as a linear combination of u1 through up, where the weight ci is just v dot ui. Remember in our previous theorem, the ci here was v dot ui divided by ui dot ui. But if I have an orthonormal basis, the norm of ui is 1, so ui dot ui, which is the square of the norm, is 1 squared, which is just 1. That's why we don't have that term at all. So again, this makes things even easier to write v as a linear combination of your basis vectors if you have an orthonormal basis. So now let's look at one last theorem. An m by n matrix u has orthonormal columns if and only if u transpose times u is the n by n identity matrix. To prove this theorem, let's write out the product u transpose times u. So in the transpose of a matrix, the columns of the matrix become the rows. So u transpose will have rows, u1 transpose as the first row, then u2 transpose as the second row, and so forth through un transpose as the last row. Multiply that with the matrix u, which has columns u1, u2, and so forth through un. This product is going to be an n by n matrix, where the top left entry would be the first row of u transpose times the first column of u. So the top left entry is u1 transpose u1. Then in the 1, 2 entry, I want to multiply the first row of u transpose with the second column of u. So that's u1 transpose u2. And so forth, if we continue, we have u1 transpose un. In the second row, I have the second row of u transpose times the first column of u. So I have u2 transpose times u1, and so forth, u2 transpose times u2, all the way through to u2 transpose times un. If we keep filling out this matrix, we have the following. As you can see, the i jth entry of u transpose u is u i transpose times u j. But that's just the dot product of u i dot u j. Now, u transpose u is equal to the n by n identity matrix if and only if I have ones all along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, meaning that ui dot uj is equal to 1 if i equals j and ui dot uj is equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. And this is true if and only if the set u1 through un is an orthonormal set. So that completes the proof of the theorem, and this is where I'm going to end this video. In our next video, we'll look at orthogonal projections.